Hello and welcome to the world of NDE 4.0. My name is Johannes Frey and today is a great day because today we will be talking about the basics of data security. So let's get started. Yeah, if you think, see a picture like this of your computer, you know that most likely all of your data is lost. This is an example of a computer which is getting out of a uh, big fire. So for sure, if we talk about data security, we need to make sure that our data actually survives such destructive forces. It can be something like hardware defects like a fire, it can be more simpler ones like a hard drive crash or hard drive uh, failure. It can be viruses, somebody destroying your data. And that is not only true for your laptop, but also for the computers which are used to build up the cloud. So backup is one of the most important things for data security. But that's only one side to it. The other side is not protection against destructive forces, but protection against unauthorized users so that nobody sees it who is not supposed to see. Which can happen if somebody is doing a cyber attack, a data breach or anything else. So what we need is actually we need data encryption. So now but before we get into data encryption, let's talk a little bit about the basics, how our computers work. And that's binary representation. Now, if we take this seven digit word or string, that's N D E space four dot O, that's seven digits. Then each one of those seven digits has a binary representation. For example, N can be encoded into 01001110. Same we do with D, E and all the others. Now what a computer does, he pushes all of those bits together and that's the information string the computer actually uses internally. Now to make it a little bit easier to read, I still keep single digits between those individual bytes. Now eight of those bits are one byte. So in between each of those bytes, we have a space bar. For sure, in our computer, that's not used. Now, if we take this message and we want to encrypt this message, we need a few basic binary operations to understand this. Now, one of the very basic one is AND. And you all know AND also from our human conversations. AND is only true if both things around the AND are true. So only if statement A and statement B is true, the result will be true. If one of them is false, the result will be false. And if both are false, the result is also false. Same with the OR. We all know from OR, the OR from our conversations. The OR is true if one of those two arguments is actually true. If A is true, then the result is true. If B is true, the result is true. Only if both A and B are false, the result will be false. If both are true, the result will be true. Now there is one which actually we do not really have that much in our human conversation, and that's the so-called XOR, the exclusive OR. Why is it exclusive? Because if both A and B are true, actually the result is false. Only if A is true and B not, or A is false and B is true, then the result will be true. Okay, so this is the basis we need for, actually we only need the XOR for our decryption and encryption. So what we do is we have our message, NDE 4.0. 4 
and we want to encrypt it. For the encryption, we need a random number with the same length than our message. So we need seven bytes of an encrypt of a random key. And each one of those digits we have in our number, we actually XOR with the number of the message. So what we do is we take the zero, the first zero of our message with an XOR, it was the first zero of our key, and the result is zero. For the second digit in our message, one XOR one is also zero. The third digit, zero XOR one gives one. So this is how we build up our encrypted message. And you see down here that virtual or the real representation of that encrypted message, which we can read. Now, um, that's the message which you send to your receiver. Now, what the receiver does, the receiver takes this message and he also has to know the key. And then he does a byte-wise XOR operation again on all of that encrypted message. And finally, he receives NDE 4.0. Now, what we talked up to the moment is actually called symmetric cryptography. And once you use those one-time paths, as we discussed it up to the moment, this can actually not be cracked. But that is only true in having four basic rules. Actually, the key has to be really random. If you just use the random generator of your computer, nope, that one is not truly random. It has to be, the key has to be at least as long as our message. You have to only use it once. If you use it two or three times, then actually by doing some statistical analysis, you can find out as somebody eavesdropping, you can find out the key. And for sure, that key has to be kept secret by receiver and sender. If somebody else also has the key, he will also be able to actually decrypt the message. Now, there is one way how to make sure that all those four rules are actually fulfilled, and that's by using quantum cryptography. And I think in one of the future videos, I will be getting a little bit deeper into quantum computers and quantum cryptography. Now, quantum computer uh, quantum cryptography is already available, but it's really expensive. So if you want to use something more which is usable nowadays, there is, for example, the AES standard, which is advanced encryption standard, which is actually using symmetric cryptography. And what it does, it actually typically uses 128-bit blocks. In our example, our block, our encryption block was actually 56 bits long. So this one is about a bit, little bit more than double the length of the, of the key we use. So this, at least as long as the message, no, that's not true for AES anymore. And that's why what they did do is actually once that 128 bits are used, then they have a generator how to create the next 128 bits. And that's called the Galois counter mode, GCM. And sorry if I pronounce it wrong. Now, this was symmetric cryptography. There is another way, which is called the asymmetric or public key cryptography. And what it is doing is actually that everybody has two keys. A public key, which actually everybody gets, and a private key, 
which you only keep to yourself. Now, what is done is actually you give that public key to everybody else. So therefore, somebody who wants to send you a message takes your public key to encrypt the message. And finally, once you receive it, then actually you use your private key to make the decryption. Um, now, this whole thing is based on a few things. Number one, we need those encryption decryption pairs. Um, it is based on a, yeah, that on a um, so-called trapdoor one-way functions, which are actually easy to compute for the encryption, but hard to invert, meaning if you do not know that private key, it is actually, you cannot get, or it's really a lot of computation time until you get the decrypted message. And one example for those methods is the prime factorization. Um, but it is easy or it is easy to compute actually the decrypted message with additional information. And that additional information is our private key. So it might sound a little bit complicated, and it is more complicated than the symmetric one. But actually, it has one big benefit, because it's easy to share your public key. If you think back about the symmetric cryptography, it is only you and the recipient who share that key. If somebody else has it, that person can also encrypt it. In this case, actually, everybody can know your public key because you keep your private key for yourself and tell it to nobody. So that's why this asymmetric cryptography is so, so much interesting. Now, <clears throat> if we talk about those two, you might ask, okay, why are there those two? It's quite simple. Asymmetric, as we talked about it, does not require the exchange of the secret key. But actually, asymmetric is much more computational intensive. And asymmetric, mostly, you, therefore, you use it actually to build up a connection and to actually only send a very short message. And that short message you send using the asymmetric is actually the key for the symmetric. So you just use asymmetric to exchange a key. Once that key is exchanged, for example, for AES, then all your long message, you use symmetric cryptography. So that's how those two belong together. Now, for sure, um, there are there is not only symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Um, there are different ways of encrypting and decrypting messages, but that, those are the most common ones. Now, there is also that we already spoke about quantum computers. Actually, a lot of the the uh, asymmetric cryptography can be actually broken by using quantum computers quite easily. So there are needs for thinking about thinking ahead of quantum computers, thinking about post quantum encryption and decryption algorithms. So thank you for watching this video. If you have any comments, feel free to leave them down here in the description field in the comment field. Next time, we will be getting a little bit into some terms, into the terms digitization, digitalization, 
what is the difference between those two? Informatization and more. As usual, you will find more information in the description. I hope you liked this video. I hope you subscribe to this channel. I hope you give me a thumbs up. I hope I will see you soon. So thank you for watching. See you soon. Thank you and bye.